Hi, hi everyone. My name is Nessim Ashouch and uh, I'm a project manager at the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation in, uh, in Brussels, uh, where, I, where I live and from where the, this uh, webinar is, uh, is hosted. This webinar is also co-hosted uh, with the New York uh, office of the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation and uh, with my dear colleague, my dear colleague, uh, Aaron, who's, uh, who will be my, my, wingman today, my wingman today. So um, <clears throat> I guess uh, I would like to thank you again, because in those time of confinement, when it's really easy to feel uh, secluded and, and isolated, um, I think uh, we have those, uh, sometimes we feel that we have like so much, uh, so much going on online. And I know that we all have like so many webinars uh, going on, but it's also, uh, a place to actually feel a feel a sense of community and uh, and uh, and being together in those very very complicated time. So again, <clears throat> um, the this new webinar series that is starting today with the first episode called "Seeing Red: Internationalist Vision Toward a Green New Deal" has been developed by the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation, New York, and Brussels, and in cooperation with Transform Europe. Europe. Transform Europe is a network of uh, 34 European organizations from 22 countries active in the field of political education and critical scientific analysis. And Transform is also the, the political foundation of the uh, European Left Party. And also with our partners from North America, the Canadian Center for Policy and Alternative, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and the, and the Institute of Policy Studies, both based in the US. And also, last but not least, uh, a former colleague, Ethan Earl, a long-standing uh, long colleague at the, the New York office, who is now uh, cons a consultant and uh, um, political consultant, and who has uh, been of a great help in shaping this, uh, this series. Just a very, uh, like a few words about the, the, the Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung. Uh, we are an uh, internationally operating nonprofit organization for civic education uh, li linked to the Gem German left party, Die Linke. We are based in Germany and in 25 offices all around the world. And we strive to develop alternative concepts and approaches for comprehensive process of social transformation. And the Brussels office operates as a, as a think tank, reflecting on European and international issues of today's society. So now I think just before diving into the, 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 the great panel that we have here today, and I know it's, you, you're here for that, but just a few words of why we are starting this series uh, around the, 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 green, the Green New Deal and or the Global Green New Deal. And um, this is coming from a project that was uh, planned before the, 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 the start of the corona crisis and seen as a long-term development in the office and based on the already existing uh, work that the, that the foundation does on, on social ecological transformation, core of the work of the foundation. And, and I think it also comes a lot uh, from the, the assessments of how daily work uh, with partners, grassroots organization, NGO, civic, civic education organization, um, from the assessment that we are actually facing a multidimensional crisis. And this crisis can be separated into, broken into three points. First of all, a, cl a climate breakdown that is already happening for a long time in the global south. I won't uh, spend too much time around that, uh, but it's very, very important to, to remind that, that frontline communities are currently confronted to climate crisis and, and uh, the corona crisis is not something that. And we are also facing economic and social crisis with a, a capitalist system that keeps on bringing crisis and with bringing this, you, the same recipe of austerity for the, for the majority of the people while, while 
continuing in increasing inequality within societies and uh, all around the globe as well. And finally, and consequently, I would say we, we are facing also a, a democratic crisis with many liberal democracies that are showing signs of possible collapse or at least of, of hybridation into some forms that we are still sometimes far away to understand and, and, and classify. And I think this is why the question of a Green New Deal or the concept of the Green New Deal is such an interesting concept uh, and to, to, to develop and to bring up because it refuses to, separ to separate those three crises and make really clear that they are interconnected and that by tackling the, the climate crisis, we first need to reorganize our social and economic organization and the way we are interdependent uh, uh, between the, the countries and also in the global north toward the global south. Um, but saying that, I will uh, leave us, uh, we'll, I will leave the, the, the pleasure of introducing the, the first question and, and, and my panelists. And the first question, um, because we have the chance today to have uh, three speakers that are based in uh, three different conf uh, continents, um, and as an introduction to, to this series and the concept of, uh, of a Green New Deal or radical social uh, ecological transformation, um, I think we have, uh, the, my, my question will be that we have been hearing a lot about uh, the concept of the, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, sometimes without grasping what, uh, what it really takes or what it, what it really means. So we have here the, the, the Green New Deal, but also the, the Green Industrial Revolution, the Green Deal, meaning different things to different individuals and groups. And uh, I, would like, I, would have, I would love to ask what it means for our, for our panelists and what it means in the social and political context they are involved and that they are, yeah, and that they, they are politically and, and socially involved in. And so maybe as a first, uh, for my first, uh, this first question, I, I will turn to um, our dear <coughs> Professor Walden Bello. Uh, Walden, you're a professor of sociology at the, State Uni at the State University of New York at Binghamton. You're also a senior analyst at the Banco based Focus on the Global South. You served for a long time as a member of the House of Representatives in the Philippines, and you're an author and co-author of 20, more than 20 books, with the latest one, Paper Dragons, uh, China and the next, next Crash, where you were already talking about the, the next uh, economic crisis coming. Uh, well done, I handle you the floor. Uh, thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, okay, well, uh, uh, thank you to uh, the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar. And um, I'm happy to be participating with the other um, panelists. Um, well, um, Basically, um, you know, let me just begin by saying that we have, uh, um, in the midst of a very tremendous crisis, we don't, you know, need to uh, repeat that at this point in time, but, you know, as uh, my colleague Jayati Ghosh from uh, New Delhi, um, uh, uh University, basically she said, you know, that this is uh, a crisis that um, in terms of its impact will probably be worse than the Great Depression uh, and definitely worse than what happened during the Second World War. And uh, I think the, the um, uh, statistics um, that have been coming out just bear this. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. Um, first quarter um, results in terms of GDP, uh, you know, it's showed a more than 4% decline uh, from last year. But basically, you know, we, 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 we've gone in other webinars about the, the impact of the, uh, of, the, of the crisis, tremendous loss of jobs, um, uh, and in particular, a very, very great uh, impact on the global south, where I am speaking right now from, from Bangkok. Um, the second thing I would just like to say is, you know, that um, 
while we are focused on strategic visions and and, and, and long-term um, and medium-term strategies uh, for global, for transforming the economic system, uh, we must not forget, you know, that in the short term, this is, you know, um, we have a going to have, uh, uh, in addition to COVID-19, we're going to have a very, very great crisis um, that uh, could possibly lead to very widespread hunger uh, and, uh, in, in, in the global south. Uh, and we're, you know, the, this is going to be the second phase of the crisis, a tremendous impact, uh, uh, possible widespread uh, hunger happening. Um, so uh, in this connection, uh, of course, in terms of short-term measures, we must really be thinking about, um, you know, among other things, uh, you know, why it's just a massive forgiveness of, of, uh, of the debt of the Global South uh, at this point in time. One of the best ways by which we could have, you know, the, the you know, the, you know, uh, cushioned impact uh, in the global south is just uh, debt uh, forgiveness uh, at this point in time. Uh, of course, um, there should be uh, massive aid uh, happening, um, both uh, bilateral aid, but uh, we're also thinking about tremendous um, um, aid liquidity being added, uh, you know, to the global system to, you know, to, to make sure that you know, that, that uh, the whole thing doesn't crash completely at this point in time. And uh, with respect to that, we should really be thinking about um, uh, things like creating a new global currency uh, under the UN at this point. We've been talking about, uh, um, you know, something that would replace the dollar. Uh, well, this is a time by which under the ages of the United Nations, uh, we can begin talking about creating a new fiat money that could be used to prop up global liquidity and uh, uh, get, you know, prevent uh, a tremendous economic crisis from uh, what is happening. Uh, the third thing, uh, and this uh, comes right into your question, the concept of a Green New Deal, of course, is um, a radical uh, economic uh, reorganization of the economy uh, so that on the one hand, um, you have um, a really a positive uh, relationship between the global economic system and the environment, you know, something that there is a positive synergy and not the sorts of contradiction at this point uh, in which the, the economy um, driven by the capitalist drive for profit continually destroys the environment. Um, and the other thing, of course, the other thing that's important to that is that we also have a reorganization of uh, economic relationships um, you know, uh, among societies and within societies uh, so that um, we have um, the fostering of cooperation instead of the dog-eat-dog -dog competition that you have under capitalism, uh, and uh, we have, uh, um, you know, um, you know, the creation of uh, positive international trade and economic relationships. Uh, uh, again, uh, with we're talking about the subordination of the market, subordination of profits uh, uh, to the values of. Um, um, ecological solidarity of justice um, and uh, of um, of peace. So basically, we're talking about a very strong total transformation in terms of the way that the economy, uh, human beings relate to the planet and among themselves to eliminate the alienation between the economy and the ecology and to eliminate the alienation among human beings that is very rife under uh, um, um, capitalism. Now, the one thing though that I would say here is that the, the, um, the, the, um, um, uh, the situation uh, in, in the Global South is when we talk about the Green New Deal, this is mainly something that has come up uh, in the North. Uh, whereas in the Global South, I think um, uh, um, while the importance of the environment 
uh, is, uh, and, and our relations to the environment is definitely very central. Uh, there's also been a lot of the changes have been conceptualized under, you know, greater um, ending uh, the, the, the subordination of the global south to the north uh, and creating more equitable trade relations and, of course, creating conditions of eliminating um, domestic inequalities. So uh, that's, you know, the, the conception of a new deal um, is not just focused on the environment, but also on the relations among uh, groups, classes, and individuals uh, towards uh, in, in the centrality of equality uh, in, in that context. So what I'd just like to say, though, is that um, the paradigms for change isn't just the Green New Deal. Um, there have been, even before the Green New Deal, uh, 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 organizations, um, individuals have promoted, for instance, deglobalization uh, as, as, as a paradigm. Uh, we have also the paradigm of food sovereignty and the peasant movement uh, and farmers uh, have, have specially been uh, uh, pushing the, 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 the concept of uh, and strategy of food sovereignty, uh, Vietnam Pacina and others, for instance. Uh, we just, I just wanted to say that the Transnational, Corpor uh, uh, Transnational Institute, uh, we've just brought out, in fact, the, the a paper that says that um, um, let's not waste uh, let's not uh, have a good crisis go to waste. This is the time for food sovereignty, and that's that's just been made available at this point in time. And of course, there have been the paradigms of eco-feminism, uh, emancipatory Marxism, uh, and um, Buen Vivir, uh, which you know we we see has come out from from uh, indigenous. Um, uh, peoples in in Latin America. So so basically, what I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the Green New Deal must be seen as one of several um, uh, strategies for profound radical transformation that have emerged over the last 25 years. And the important thing is to realize that there are complementaries complementarities among these strategies. And maybe what we need to flesh out is how we can make these strategies um, coming from different parts of the world, uh, uh, you know, come together and have a very synergistic relationship that would move them uh, forward. I have just two um, last points to make, uh, and it's more of, um, uh, the, the, the next one is more of a question. One is, can we really have a Green New Deal uh, under capitalism? Uh, and I think, um, uh, and, 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 and that's, I think that's going to be a very important uh, um, um, issue for us to discuss. The, the last point that I would just like to say is that, of course, in order to bring, uh, bring about a Green New Deal uh, or other complementary alternative strategies to restructure the relations among people and of the economy to the environment, it will mean a lot of political struggle. Okay? And, and, uh, and I think that this is something that we, we really uh, must face up to. So I think on the one hand, uh, let me just end with this one is, um, you know, there is this idea among the established elites that, yes, there is a crisis going on, but um, we can return to normality. You know, it's, 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 it's just, it's big, it's a big crisis, but it's the, the system of production and consumption remains the same. And, you know, the, the, the widely uh, leaked um, 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 uh, uh, tele teleconference among the that was sponsored by Goldman Sachs, uh, which was uh, you know which uh, uh, basically saw the, the thinking of these people that hey you know um, let's open up the economy and uh, uh, nothing's really wrong. Um, 
The second thing, uh, perspective is the one that says that, yes, this is not going to be a new normal, but then the changes that will be needed is mainly things like, oh, social distancing and how do we create factories that would, that would allow some sort of, um, you know, you know, a more, um, a more healthy uh, work situation and that sort of thing. And then of course, uh, there's, uh, there's our perspective, uh, which is this radical transformation. My own sense here is this, uh, one is of course the, the neoliberals, um, you know, have tremendous power at this point. They, you know, neoliberalism is uh, undergoing a great crisis of credibility, but they still have, they have a lot of power. Let's not underestimate that. The second thing is um, the big challenge of the neoliberals are the, what we might call the radical right wing. And uh, I think Nassim, you already have, uh, you know, indicated, you know, that uh, this radical right wing movements are on the rise all over the world. And oftentimes they take a very vicious nationalist form. Um, and oftentimes they even adopt some of this uh, slogans of deglobalization saying, hey, you know, the economy, but only for whites, the economy, for, but only for the people who've been here for a long time. And, you know, as for migrants, uh, to hell with migrants, we're going to close up, you know, and, you know, and this even feeds sometimes to some of the uh, um, uh, uh, environmentalist right wing thinking, for instance, Garrett Harding, who basically said, you know, several years ago that, you know, we have life both ethics at this point in time, the, uh, the earth can support all of these people. And of course, uh, James Lovelock, you know, the, the uh, guy who, who, who talked about Gaia saying, hey, you know, uh, tremendous, uh, you know, the, the carrying capacity of the planet is, 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 is no longer possible. Uh, and maybe we should be reducing it to about a billion people from 9.6 billion. Uh, and uh, so there's that sort of right wing environmentalist thinking that's feeding into uh, the, the kind of uh, right wing uh, political thinking that's there at this point in time. Uh, where are we? That's the question. Politically, I think, you know, that there are these two contending forces, the neoliberals who are discredited but powerful, and then the rising right wing that have adopted parts of the or cherry some of the um, slogans uh, of the progressive movement uh, in order to make themselves seem creditable, uh, but with a very strong racist uh, and anti-migrant twist. And uh, where are the progressives at this point in time? Uh, that's, I think, the big question. We have to get into this political uh, arena at this point in time. Uh, and um, make ourselves really a political force. So that's it. That's my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walden. Thank you so much. And I, yeah, so many things that have that have been said. Um, quite, quite hard to summarize. But I will keep with the question: What are the? What is the progressive side? Do, progressive side doing right now? And uh, and I think that's. Uh, that's a, an open question that we will try to 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 discover, actually. Um, and because you you mentioned it, uh, the, the 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 great paper that you just wrote for the for the transnational institute, I would just take the opportunity as well to announce uh, the latest uh, cooperation we will have with the transnational institute for all this uh, upcoming series. So it's uh, I think that will please you and uh, a lot. Of, uh, a lot of other people for the, the this great allies that will that that will share the, the the series with us. I will now turn to to the to the second panelist that joined us today, Thierry Francos. Thank you very much for for joining us. Tia, you are an assistant professor of political science at Providence College. Your research focuses mainly on mainly on resource extraction, renewable energy, climate change, green technology and also the left in, in America, in Latin America. And uh, you re recently are not uh, author of two, of two books. First, uh, the, the first book that you co-author is uh, Planet to Win, Where We Need a Green New Deal. 
Uh, so right in the topic of today, obviously, published by, uh, by Verso. And the second one that came out uh, this year as well is uh, res Resource Radicals from Petro-Nationalism to Post-Extractivism in Ecuador. Um, so I will ask you the, the, the same question. Can you give us like, your, your vision of the, of, the green, of the Green New Deal and what does it mean in the US maybe and maybe also in Latin America? Thank sure. You. Thank you. And, and Walden, those, those comments were, were so amazing. I'll reference some of them in, in, in what I'm about to say. Um, I'm going to start with just where, where we are, like the moment that we're in, in the U S and to some extent, you know, I'll, I'll also draw some global connections and then I'll come around to sort of how, what the green new deal means now and, and, and how to fight for it though. We'll be obviously talking about that throughout the conversation. Um, so right now in, in the U S um, the situation, situation that we're in is that recently Bernie Sanders um, suspended his campaign for president. It was a very inspiring campaign. Um, he had a very big coalition that was actually multiracial and multigenerational. And he was an explicit, is an explicit democratic socialist and had also embraced a very Um, in the U.S. context, a pretty radical version of what the Green New Deal might be as, as a key policy platform, very oriented to social justice, to labor rights, to massive public investment in frontline communities um, and beyond. So so that that was a campaign that many of us worked very hard on. You know, we're sad that it is over, but we do not feel, I'll just, you know, speak for the left of the U.S., um, since that's where, what I'm representing now. Um, I think that we do feel that, that many of our ideas resonated with a very broad public and that the Bernie Sanders campaign, despite being suspended now um, due to the way that centrist political forces consolidated against him, despite that campaign being suspended, it gave a lot of life to a lot of social movements and a lot of platform like a big sort of media and, and public platform to those movements. And so we're, you know, still fighting and I'll talk about what, what we're doing right now, but that's one piece. Then of course there's the deep public health crisis, which is made dramatically worse by the privatized healthcare system and lack of social provisioning and social care that we have in the U.S. It's also made dramatically worse by the deep racial and class inequalities of the U.S. We have African Americans um, being uh, getting COVID at, at a rate that is far disproportionate to their percentage of the population. Um, we have people that are being called essential workers, and they are essential, but they are working everywhere from grocery stores to warehouses to hospitals and being exposed to, to contagion without, without proper care or paid sick leave or, or anything. Um, we also are entering an enormous economic crisis, of course, The contours and depth of that crisis are dramatically worse in the global south, as Walden Beller just said. But in the U.S., it's also devastating. We have 26 million, but the number will go up today in the coming days, 26 million that have just applied for unemployment. That's a historic number. Um, we have um, just a huge amount of the workforce is, is out of work and really not doesn't have um, the economic security to even pay rent. We're going to see what happens on May 1st, May Day, but it might actually big a, be a big rent strike day. We'll see because so many people cannot afford to pay their rent. Um, and so this is this is sort of the, the context in, in the U.S right now. Um, I want to add a couple of more elements um, that are going to bring us closer to talking about what, what the Green New Deal means today, what the vision is, and, and how, we, how we advocate for it. Um, a few other factors. Um, the fossil fuel industry is in free fall right now. The oil and gas industry, that's a global condition. Obviously, it's a global sector, um, but it's, it, it has some particular um, uh, ramifications in the U.S., which has the U.S. has, of course, emerged as a number one global producer of oil and gas. Um, and a lot of oil and, and, and gas and coal firms are based in the U.S. Um, and already tens of thousands of people have actually lost their jobs in that in that sector in the U.S. without a just transition, without any framework to help them. But, you know, so that's that's one piece. But Um, on the political front, I'll note that 
the sector, the, the fossil fuel industry is really one of the primary political obstacles to a Green New Deal. And right now that sector is in disarray. So we can think about, you know, of course the government and of course the Trump administration is going to do what they can to bail them out and subsidize them. But even with government help, the sector is in crisis. And that sector is, I would say, one of our main political enemies. And so we can think about how this changes the terrain a little bit and how we can strategically orient to, to, the, to the sector's crisis. Um, the second piece um, is, is how deeply governments in the US and around the world will be involved in economic recovery. Um, meaning that the capitalist system is in a crisis right now. And we know from history that when capitalism is in a crisis, it, even, it requires even more government help to keep accumulation going. It always requires government help. We know that. But, but that government help becomes more essential in moments of crisis and also becomes more politically visible. So we have an opportunity to think about and from the left, of course, to push our own vision of, of how government should be involved in recovery. Um, that is different than what capitalists are asking for. But this whole question of how does the state and capital relate um, is going to be very much on the table in terms of political debate. So that's another um, piece. Um, another thing I'll, I'll mention is that COVID-19 um, is about to, the sort of global pandemic crisis um, uh, and the hunger crisis and the, the economic devastation it's causing that Walden spoke so eloquently about are about to intersect with the climate crisis, right? So we get we get a lot in the U.S., especially from the right wing, from those same right wing forces that Walden was talking about at the end, that like the climate crisis and the Green New Deal are irrelevant right now. But in fact, that's not the case at all for a few reasons that I think are clear to many people on this call. One reason, um, and this was just spoken to in the previous comments a bit, is that the same communities that are on the front line of the climate, climate crisis are on the front line of COVID. They are, there is disproportionate impact due to um, political, uh, due to social and economic inequality that is, um, that has geographic, race, class, gender dimensions to it, right? So the same communities are, are being impacted. That's one connection between them. Another connection between them is both require public investment and public policy oriented towards social welfare, um, and also public health and, and planetary well-being in order to address them. But another even more acute intersection is that in the next few weeks, and I'm speaking in the US, but again, there's global um, ramif global kind of dimensions to all this as well, but I'll just say a little about the US that in the coming weeks, we're gonna enter into wildfire season. And we all remember like the wildfires that devastated California, that devastated a lot of the West Coast and Southwest um, last year um, and killed actually many people and, 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 and had a lot of um, social and economic impacts. So we have wildfires coming soon. It's gonna be a very bad year according to the climate scientists. Then we have a hurricane season. That of course is gonna affect deeply the Caribbean, the, the Gulf Coast, you know, uh, those regions of, of the US and of Latin America. Um, and so very soon we're gonna simultaneously Simultaneously be confronting the coronavirus and be confronting the the unfolding climate crisis. We know the climate crisis is already here, and we also know that you know at certain times of year, due to weather patterns, um, it is more salient, and and it's going to be salient soon. And we're, this is going to happen at a moment where our public capacity to respond to emergency is very low. It's very stretched, very thin. We already have, as I said, this privatized system of social care in the U.S. and very insufficient public funding um, to deal with 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 emergencies, and and our and our capacities are tapped by the by the by the coronavirus. And so I'm not sure how we will, will publicly be able to respond to needing to evacuate people from wildfires, from sea level rise, from hurricanes, right? Um, and, and to care for them and to shelter them. So, so those crises are gonna intersect and they are going to devastate communities that are on the front lines and that and the same communities who overrepresent in terms of essential workers that I mentioned, right? So there, it's like, you know, a triple whammy or a you know, and, and so we need to think about how to both be in solidarity with those communities to, you know, activate our mutual aid networks and to think about how to provide care when the state and, and, and of course, corporations are not. But we also need to think about making very bold demands on the state 
um, and on corporations, right, both in the workplace and through labor strikes, but also through the political arena, how to make very bold demands and to not feel like because there is a lot of immediate need that it's 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 like a distraction to talk about the world we want to create. The world we want to create, we need to talk about it right now because it's a, you know, the alternative model that we are proposing would address people's immediate needs. Um, and also, I think that there is a political opening now to actually push for it. And so I'll get to that. And now I'll sort of come to, I think, answering your question a little bit more directly. But I just want to sort of um, uh, underline the implications of what I've been saying. Um, the fossil fuel industry is in free fall. Governments are going to need to be involved in economic recovery. They already are. COVID um, and the climate crisis are, are intersecting. And so what I want to say is that we are at a critical juncture in the U.S. and elsewhere. I don't want to speak for other places in the world, so I'll st speak from my own context. Um, we are in a critical juncture where one of two things can happen um, to, to simplify a lot. Obviously, there's a lot of future scenarios, but to simplify a lot, and I think this echoes some of Walden's comments, we can either, um, through public policy and through the way the state might help capitalism, we can either just worsen and exacerbate our current model. We can become more dependent on fossil fuels, bail out the fossil fuel industry, bail out all of the industries that pollute our environment, um, we can create a more unequal, more financialized, more economically precarious system. That is exactly what happened after 2008. I don't want to say too much about that because Grace is like the like one of the world's experts on this. So I'm sure she you know, can talk about it more than me. But what we know is that the way the recovery happened after the 2007, 2008 financial crisis in the US and in other places, it made everything worse. It, 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 it increased the racial gap in wealth. It made workers more precarious. It made our system more financialized and more privatized. It increased emissions. So that's the way we dealt with the last crisis. And this crisis, as Walden said at the outset of his comments, is even worse of worse crisis. And so those same economic and political actors are going to try to double down on the existing on the existing system, right, and use it as an opportunity to preserve their class power. Um, and to preserve the status quo that is, you know, destroying our planet, right? So that's one path. The other path is that the left social movement, social justice forces um, coordinate like like exactly like we're doing with this web webinar. I can't say how happy I am. I mean, it almost makes me cry a little bit to see so many people from all over the world connecting. And even though, as Walden said, we don't have to use all the same words like I don't care if people use the Green New Deal language, but we're all talking about similar ideas here. We're coming together. And I think that we need to do that in our local context, like in our cities, provinces, municipalities. We need to do that in nationally and transnationally and globally, right? So we have this opportunity right now where some of our, our, our enemies are weakened, where the state is going to have a role no matter what, where we can put forward an alternative vision of how to recover from this crisis. And um, I'll sort of wrap this up a little bit now and, and, and address some parts of the question and also some things that Walden said. Something that I've been working on in the U.S. along with other people is what we call a green stimulus. We have written a letter. I can put it in the link in the chat later. We have written a letter to Congress that outlines a proposal for a stimulus for an economic recovery me um, measures that are both uh, uh, low carbon um, and environmentally sustainable and also socially just because we need to recover our economy in a way that puts us on a different track that puts us on a track towards a democratic, egalitarian, and environmentally sustainable economic system, a new model that replaces our current model. You know, lay the groundwork. I don't think it's, we have a revolution tomorrow. I mean, unfortunately, I wish we could, but I don't think we're at that place right now in terms of our, of our level of organization on the left. But I think we can absolutely press for public policies from civil society and from labor unions and from all of our left forces and put pressure on our allies in Congress Congress, in the case of the U.S., we have no allies in the White House right now, but in Congress, there are some left wing members of Congress. So we're putting pressure on them. I'm working with several people and a lot of different groups have endorsed this green stimulus idea. And I just want to note, because I know that the Green Deal in Europe is a very top down capitalist kind of vision. With green stimulus, we are applying the Green New Deal, the sort of much more socially just um, approach to, to a just transition um, to renewable energy. Um, uh, so I just wanted to clarify that because I know there are many people from Europe on the call. So a green stimulus basically applies
applies what Walden defined as a Green New Deal to our recovery efforts. And it turns out that like um, applying the idea of, of um, reorienting our whole society to be more environmentally sustainable and more socially just, and specifically using public investment and the public sector to sort of help rebuild uh, this, uh, to help build a new society, is something that would help address once we are able to get back to work, which we can't yet, but in the coming months, would actually create a lot of dignified jobs, a lot of dignified livelihoods, unionized jobs, that people can actually work in renewable energy, work in ecosystem restoration, have a jobs guarantee that, that guarantees that they will have work um, that is good, high quality, well-paying work to actually pay better our teachers, our nurses that we view as, as green jobs. We think of, you know, care work as green work, right? So all of this we can fund publicly through the public sector. The idea that um, we can't afford it or how are we going to pay for it is, you know, never answer that argument. Like the right wing right now is giving hundreds of millions of billions of dollars to bail out corporations. So there's never a lack of money. The question is the political will and the, the sort of um, power on the left to make sure that we channel that public investment in a way that benefits communities um, and benefits the planet, right? And the, 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 the last thing that, that I will say here, and just to reiterate also some of Walden's points, we, I think we also, even though I've been talking more about the U.S., because, you know, that's partly why I'm on the call to sort of give the perspective from the U.S., um, I think that, you know, the people that I've been working with on Green New Deal politics in the U.S. have a very internationalist vision. We've been involved in a variety of transnational networks, a lot of them um, based in the Americas, based in the hemisphere, Latin America and the U.S. and Canada, but also, you know, and some of you I've, on this call, I've been involved in, in, in networks that involve Europe and the U.K. as well. And, and we need to branch and broaden them to, to all regions of the world, of course. Um, but I think what's really interesting right now is, is two last points that I'll make. One, and this this follows up on something Walden said at the end. We in the global north, I think we don't we shouldn't be possessive about our ideas or think we have the best ideas. There are amazing ideas from Buen Vivir that 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 Walden was mentioning um, uh, to, you know, degrowth um, that comes, you know, a lot from Europe, Buen Vivir, a lot from Latin America. The idea of food sovereignty that comes from all over the global south that are really essential elements in thinking of ways to. Uh, create a model, a social model that that um, that is harmonious with nature and that is socially just. Right. So I think that this whole kind of ecosystem, to use that metaphor of ideas, is very inspiring and we should pay homage to people that have been developing them for many years, um, but also see them as connected to one another and create, you know, spaces like the one we're in right now, where there can be relatively egalitarian exchange of ideas, um, because I think that's, that's what the world needs right now. We need to, you know, we can't rely on global elites to create international cooperation. We need to create international and global cooperation operation from below, um, uh, using the networks that we have and building also new institutions um, of, of, of that are that are left wing and that and that and that do the second thing that I want to respond to Walden's point, those left wing kind of institutions and networks that provide an alternative vision to because I completely agree with Walden's point that it's either there's either neoliberal globalism or there's right wing kind of so-called isolationism, but it's pro, totally pro-capitalist. It's not really isolationist, but they use that language. And I think, you know, we, the left needs to intervene and with its own vision of global cooperation that is not neoliberal, that is not technocratic, that is not elite, um, but that is about, you know, all of these visions from a bottom up kind of coming, kind of percolating from the bottom up that, that we've been discussing. Um, and that specifically the left needs to have its own vision of trade, um, the left needs to have its own vision of, of, of global financial institutions, right? Like each of these are arenas that the left should be intervening in because otherwise we have this very, very, um, uh, I think, scary situation where it's like a racist, xenophobic version of capitalism versus like versus this kind of like superficially progressive um, neoliberal kind of vision of capitalism. And those are like the only two options. Um, there is a third option. And that third option is not a triangulation between those. It's a complete alternative to both of those. That is internationalist based in solidarity, but thinking very in very sophisticated ways of how do we use trade in a different way? How do we organize trade in a different way? How do we completely 
completely um, work against like the, the crushing situation of sovereign debt that, that Walden talked about and, and very bold statements about debt relief. How do we reorganize the financial system so that it's stable and so that it prioritizes, as Walden said, people's ability to, to work and live and spend and not the just ability of capitalists to, to invest across borders, right? So we need to actually think about these global institutions and propose alternatives for the left because I think right now, the world is in crisis and very scary things can happen in crisis, but they are also opportunities to present alternative visions. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh. Nassim, you are muted, sorry. I, I thought I was not. Yeah, no, very briefly, thank you very much, Fifia, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation again, and, and so much what I said and in a, in a very strong, uh, very strong language. So that, that's, that's great. And, and I will keep the two, two main ideas that you, that you presented, the, 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 the link between the climate crisis and the, and the COVID crisis that we are living on and, and the, the responses they, they, they ask for both. And uh, also in terms of the of the frontline communities, and this idea of the green stimulus that uh, will allow uh, to sort of introduce a green new deal in a way in the uh, and in a mix with the with a just transition um, uh, sort of uh, sort of program that sounds uh, that sounds like promising and, and something that is doable in a in a short. Uh, short time time right now and without uh, more time because we are running late i will uh, turn to the third to our third panelist uh, today um grace bakley thank you very much for for joining us grace your research fellow at the institute for public policy research a think tank in london you are also an economics and politics commentator columnist and uh, you're right now writing for the the newspaper the tribun the Tri tribun Okay. And you are obviously a Labour Party activist, and uh, you just wrote a book uh, this year, "Stolen: How to How to Save the World from Financialization." So, yeah. thank you very much for joining us, and I leave you the floor to to introduce. Thank you very much, the same, um, and thanks everyone for joining this call. It's great to see uh, to see so many of you on the line. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll talk today a little bit about the kind of Green New Deal in the UK context. Um, and, uh, yeah, and as you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, there's been this term, the Green Industrial Revolution, that's been used by some people to describe uh, what's going on here, but also talk about more generally um, how the Green New Deal could uh, could be used as a, a kind of response to the crisis that we're finding ourselves in now and how this crisis and the response to it will have to link back to um, what will have to be based in an, an engagement with the understand and an understanding of uh, the kind of changing nature of capitalism that has been generated in the period since the financial crisis, but also that this uh, coronavirus pandemic is contributing to. Um, you know, so the first thing to start with is the recognition that capitalism generates crises. Um, and crises tend to change things, but they do not always change things in the way that you expect. And really, I think the way that we should understand crises as, as socialists is uh, as as, uh, as opportunities that generate the potential for divergent forms of action. Now, that action does not always have to lead inexorably to kind of um, progressive socialist transformation, but it does create opportunities where human agency can really begin to shift things. Now, you know, we can kind of see this in the wake of the financial crisis where a lot of, of, of socialists after 2008 were kind of um, sitting back and waiting for uh, that crisis basically to kind of create some sort of revolution because it, uh, it clearly indicated the inherent uh, contradictions and problems generated by financial capitalism. Uh, but nothing really changed until we began to organise. Nothing changed until... Uh, you know, socialists began to uh, kind of come together from the various different divergent movements that they had uh, splintered into during the period of kind of neo neoliberal hegemony and refocus on, on electoral politics. Um, and I think, you know, that 
is important is going to be important to bear in mind because in the depths of crises like this, you know, socialists often expect people to respond with kind of very radical and, and you know revolutionary um, zeal, but actually, often crises tend to generate a form of kind of small c conservatism. Where people wait for everything to get back to normal. It's only when things don't get back to normal that you start to see that um, the, the decline in support for the status quo in the way that we saw uh, around the rich world uh, in particular, um, kind of five or six years after the financial crisis and, and until today. So I think, you know, some of the narratives that we're going to be hearing around the coronavirus crisis today are, you know, obviously, you know, we've been discussing this a lot on the call, right? The fact that you know, states are massively expanding their support for the private sector, um, how they are running massive fiscal deficits, how central banks are engaging in effectively often monetary financing of their deficits, i.e. Um, they are, you know, creating money in order to buy government bonds, something we've been told is impossible for a long time. Um, and we're going to be hearing about how this basically proves that we have enough money to do anything that we like, that the Green New Deal is perfectly possible, um, and that there are no resource constraints. Um, but there's kind of an issue with this narrative, I suppose, which is that most people aren't going to experience this crisis in terms of the lack of a resource constraint. Um, and I think this kind of cuts to the core of the issue, which is that, yes, we're going to be seeing more state intervention in the economy, but the way that those resources are used are going to, is going to be influenced by class power and class struggle. And of course, we have to recognize the fact that we live under capitalism, which is a holistic system, not just an economic system, which is separate from a, a form of politics governed uh, by... Excuse me, Grace, do you mind just slowing down just a little bit for our interpreters to hear? Thank you so much. So sorry, I'm always told that I speak too fast, so I'll I'll try and slow down. Um, so yeah, most people aren't going to experience this crisis in terms of the lack of a resource constraint uh, because state power, the power of capitalist states, again, you know, we live in a capitalist system with capitalist states, capitalist international institutions, as well as uh, capitalist businesses themselves. Um, that those resources are going to be used in a way that reinforces pre -exist the pre-existing balance of power between different classes. And we've already seen basically that state power is being used in a way that supports the interests of capital, often directly against the interests of labour. And I think we can see this narrative kind of coming apart on that front, um, but also in, in a couple of other ways. So firstly, this narrative that uh, we have enough money to be able to do whatever we want it's true for imperialist economies at the core of the global system, but as we've just been hearing, it's certainly not true of the global south. And actually, you know, one of the, the biggest and least talked about crises that we're seeing at the moment is uh, the mounting debt crisis that is being experienced by many states in the global south uh, as capital flees those economies in search of kind of safe assets in the global north which is sending borrowing costs very high, um, and meaning that some countries are, are on the brink of, of defaulting on their debt. Indeed, even before this crisis, uh, many states were in deep debt distress anyway. Those structural issues that generate um, unsustainable levels of debt which, uh, for the global south, forcing them to um, appeal to international investors. Um, on global bond markets, often, you know, which often demand the imposition of neoliberal policies in response, is not something that's gone away. And we should really be, as we've just been hearing, be pushing for um, for a debt write off for the global south. Um, which, you know, there was talk about that happening uh, during the spring meetings of the IMF uh, and the World Bank, but of course, nothing of the kind ended up uh, being put on the table. This is also, incidentally, the most important issue that Europe will be facing, uh, because none of the issues that emerged in the wake of the financial crisis um, and the sovereign debt crisis have been dealt with, really. We're still, you know, not that much closer towards a banking union, and we're certainly very, very far away from debt neutralisation in Europe, something that's not really likely to happen. I, I can't see it happening ever, to be honest, given the reticence of, of Northern European states. So um, the divergent capacities of states to be able to borrow um, in order to spend, to mitigate the impact of this crisis, is something that we must consistently account for. We must also consistently account for how that interacts with pre-existing relations of imperialism. Um, so this is not simply a capacity of access to uh, question of access to finance. It's also about longer term issues of you know access to intellectual property. Um, it's an issue of uh, monopolies largely centered in the global north. 
in their relations, the way that they structure relations between global north and global south. It's an issue of unfair trade and tax practices uh, of the proliferation of, of tax havens, which facilitate the removal of capital from the global south. So in all those ways, you know, it is really only going, only going to be a couple of very powerful core states that are going to be able to respond to this in the way that we are we are talking about now with, with effective, uh, unmitigated use of resources to support uh, the capitalist system. And of course, that is the role that is currently being played by America. Um, if we look at the reemergence of the dollar swap line networks that were brought out in the media aftermath of the financial crisis, everywhere, every central bank in the world and a lot of, lot of businesses all around the world require access to dollars. A lot of them can't get access to dollars. So the Federal Reserve has reopened these swap lines that allow central banks to swap domestic currency for dollars in order to support uh, domestic businesses that have borrowed in dollars. But which central banks are able to access that is again going to be a question of American imperial power and relationships. That's again something to consider. I think the, the second issue is it again comes back to the question of, of the nature of the capitalist state and how its resources are used. Because um, I think it's quite clear that in the aftermath of this crisis, uh, elites and the ruling classes are going to push for a return to austerity, what is called austerity in the UK. Um, I know that in, in Germany, um, this is the kind of Schwarz and Null, uh, Black Zero ideology that, that uh, enforces running a consistent uh, current account surplus. And there are variants of it, obviously, across Europe and in many other parts of the world. The contraction, not necessarily in the size of the state, because again, you can have a very big state, but one that caters exclusively to the interests of capital, but a removal of supports for working people. And again, you know, often we think of this issue of austerity as an issue of the state convincing people that. Uh, you know, isn't enough resources to go around and that we need to repay our debts to protect our, our children and grandchildren, which is true. Those are the narratives that surround it. But actually, austerity was not really about saving money or repaying debts. It was always about um, the, a capitalist state using its power to reinforce the power relationships between capital and labor, basically decimating the power of organized labor, decimating the, um, the, the basis of the material well-being of, of workers and consumers in their, in their states to prevent the kind of uh, re-emergence of any resistance to the status quo. Because obviously a, a heavily indebted, low-paid, insecurely employed worker is less likely to kind of be involved in a movement to organize and resist capitalism than, than someone who isn't in that position. So again, we have to think of austerity in terms of class power and class struggle. Um, and the ruling class is going to push for a return to austerity after this crisis is done. They're going to say, we've spent all this money propping up the system, never mind the fact that most of this money hasn't gone to work because it's gone to businesses. We've spent all this money. Now we need to tighten our belts and we're all in this together. And actually what they'll do is argue that it is working people who've suffered as a result of this crisis who have to pay and pick up the bill for uh, the support provided to huge multinational corporations uh, over the course of this crisis. And we, we really have to be prepared, prepared for this. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important to always come back to the fact that policies are important, narratives are important, but we are not going to be able to get through this struggle. We're not going to be able to rebuild on the other side without class struggle without a narrative that centers class struggle, struggle between people who own the stuff that we need to produce things and those who are forced to sell their labor um, for a wage. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, that means basically we need to, if, we, if the response to this crisis is going to be shaped by class struggle rather than simply kind of who can come up with the best narratives or who can come up with, with the best ideas, then we need to think more about strategy. If we want, which I think we all agree we want, a, a response to the coronavirus crisis, which, as, as Thea was just outlining, uh, is along the lines of a kind of um, Green New Deal stimulus package where um, the kind of 
massive contraction and demand that has been associated with the lockdown measures is absorbed by a massive expansion in government spending, uh, but government spending that is directed towards decarbonizing the economy and doing so in a way that's just. Um, we're going to need to think about a strategy that will allow us to argue for that and, and to demand it and to um, and to uh, organise for it electorally and um, and outside of, uh, of of party politics. And I think that means we need to think more deeply about how this crisis is actually changing the nature of capitalism. And, and I think I've written quite a lot about recently and, and, uh, and I have written for Tribune and uh, Jackman and various other places about is how we are kind of moving into, into a phase of state monopoly capitalism. And basically, what we're seeing is a, a massive consolidation of power, economic political power, in a very small number of hands. So um, political leaders, central bankers, um, corporate executives, financiers control an increasingly significant portion of the global economy for a number of reasons. Firstly, crises. We were, we're already living in a, a kind of monopoly capitalism where markets were becoming ever more concentrated uh, for a whole host of reasons, um, uh, most notably the kind of big, big tech companies. But crises tend to be moments where consolidation and concentration takes place even quicker because small businesses, ones that are more indebted, have lower margins, less cozy relationships with the state, fall, fail, and they tend to be bought up by their larger rivals, especially when you have very low interest rates, which allow them to borrow money cheaply to expand. Um, at the same time, those big monopolies tend to have big cash piles uh, because you, you become a monopoly basically by restricting investment uh, in order to push up the price of the goods that you're selling. So they're not investing everything, they're keeping big piles of cash, which allows them obviously to withstand the crisis. But they also have tend to have very close relationships with both banks, the banks that that are, they are client that are their clients and the state, um, which is obviously going to use its, its power to kind of provide support for them. Um, so uh, yeah, we kind of we, we we are going to emerge from this crisis with a much more monopol a monopolistic and, and concentrated form of capitalism, where the big, massive, particularly the tech monopolies, which are obviously doing very well out of the move online, um, are going to survive and thrive. Lots of other small businesses are going to fail. Uh, and big monopolies in the global north will come to control a much larger amount of economic activity. The closer relationships between those businesses and states that will emerge from this crisis are also something to think about because we will start to see massive state bailouts. We'll, we, you know, we already have. We will start to see the state continuing to use its resources, whether that's providing cheap loans, whether it's um, you know, active bailouts, whether it's measures like quantitative easing, which uh, serve to um, well, basically uh, provide um, investors with um liquidity that they can use to invest in in other assets and thereby limiting falls in asset prices. So in other words, maintaining the wealth of the wealthy, um, even whilst the rest of the economy founders, all of these different tools are going to be used in the interest of capital um, because of the growing uh, and increasingly close relationships between these politicians, central bankers and these big powerful monopolies. And then again, you have the kind of coordinating power of finance, which sits atop all of this. So, you know, bear in mind that you've got these, uh, as well as having big international monopolies, you have big asset managers that are kind of single institutions that are able to control a huge amount of what goes on in lots of different public companies because they own huge stakes in those companies. So it's not just, you know, the fact that there are lots of big businesses. It's also the fact that corporate ownership is even more concentrated because a lot of that ownership is mediated by the existence of these asset managers, which basically allocate capital. And the same with the big international banks, they're able to allocate capital. They decide who gets investment, who gets, who gets loans. Um, and the coordination between these groups, between finance, big business and the state, basically has created the existence of, there was a Marxist theorist called Rudolf Hilferding who argued that capitalism would become so centralized, we would eventually have a kind of general cartel that was responsible for kind of planning economic activity. And that's kind of what we're moving towards now. We've got this tiny cabal of big businesses, central bankers, uh, politicians who are planning, basically, who gets what resources. Now, of course, this is very interesting because all the arguments against the Green New Deal, all the arguments against 
greater um, public democratic intervention in the economy is that states can't plan things, the public can't plan things, the market is too chaotic, it's a complex system, you know, um, the price mechanism doesn't work if you start planning things, if the state provides support to businesses, then it erodes competition. But of course, none of those arguments apply in a highly monopolistic and concentrated form of capitalism, where planning is effectively already taking place by the state, but in the interests of capital. This is a, a really important point, I think. It completely cuts away the kind of neoliberal Hayekian arguments against state planning. These guys are already planning. They are just saying they're providing you know, bailouts to businesses that they think are worthy of bailouts. That often includes the airline industry. It could include oil, um, uh, fossil fuels companies. It could include any industry, basically, that appeals to the state for support and the state considers whether that's because the, they have close relationships with this business or because they're providing them with, with cash, political donations, the state considers is worthy of that support. So in this sense, you know, the, the question we have is not simply arguing for um, a greater deployment of resources in order to decarbonize our economy. The argument that we really have to be making is that this is already happening. States and monopolies are already controlling what goes on in the economy, what goes on in most of our lives, but they're doing so in a way that benefits them. They're not doing so in a way that's democratic, or they're not certainly not doing so in the interests of, uh, of working class people. They're doing so in the interests of the ruling classes. And what this demands, as well as, you know, PP for carers, um, uh, income support, debt write-offs, rent freezes, and a Green New Deal in the wake of the crisis. What this demands is democratization of the economy. So the extension of the principles of political democracy into the realm of the economy. We have this big cabal that is planning so much economic activity. How do we make sure that that power, which does exist, can be used to plan things in a way that's democratic, in a way that's sustainable, um, and in a way that benefits the interests of working people. And that requires organizing, right? It requires not just making arguments, not just coming up with policy ideas, but actually shifting the balance of power in society um, by uh, bringing together all the different kind of progressive forces within the society, from the labor movement to uh, tenants unions, to various social movements, to uh, you know community organizations. And, and there's lots of those that have emerged to provide support during this time with political projects, with electoral political projects, um, in order to build a much bigger and more expansive movement capable of directly pressuring governments to, you know, act in a way that is responsive to working people, but also in a way that spreads a sense of consciousness about these issues um, and encourages wider sections of society to become involved in this struggle. Um, so... That, I think, is, is the biggest challenge we face when we're thinking about how we do a Green New Deal post-crisis, how, um, how we argue for rebuilding in a way that's sustainable and just. Uh, it's not simply the case that we need to be saying, you know, look at all this money the government spent, therefore it's going to be easy for us to use that money but spend it in a way that's just. I think we need to be saying, look at the way that this crisis has consolidated the power of a tiny elite, a tiny elite that was already abusing its power in order to consolidate its own uh, its own wealth. Um, that right, they have used this crisis. You know, there was a, a comment which Pamela said earlier, never let a serious crisis go to waste. They have used this crisis and will continue to use this crisis, which has killed so many people, not simply to harm working people, but to enrich themselves. And in response to that, we need to be saying power needs to be returned to people. Power needs to be returned to working people in their jobs. You know, we need a restructuring, a strengthening of the labor movement. Power needs to be returned to people in their communities. We need decentralization and democratization of the state. Power needs to be taken away from international institutions and handed back to uh, people within, um, within uh, democratically organized content. Uh, and, and power needs to be taken away uh, from the central bankers and, and policymakers who are using their influence to promote the interests of themselves and their friends, using the capitalist state to promote their own interests to the people for whom the state is supposed to be, uh, supposed to represent. Um, 
And doing doing that, actually focusing on building class power, focusing on creating an oppositional narrative that highlights the class divides that do exist under capitalism and will continue to exist under capitalism. is I think the only way that we get to uh, the kinds of policies that, you know, everyone, not even socialists, but, you know, liberals and whoever else could argue for just in very different ways, you know, liberals will be found in the wake of this crisis saying the state needs to just um, use this opportunity to have a stimulus package that you know reduces carbon emissions and uh, makes the economy less unequal whatever but the difference between that kind of liberal argument uh, kind of you know a classical liberal argument and a socialist argument is that there is an assumption here that the state if left to its own devices and if convinced with ideas and if lobbied by intellectuals will do the right thing Whereas as socialists, I think we have to be aware that we are talking to capitalist states that have their own sense of their own interests. And the only way that they will be made to listen to and respond to the demands of working people is if we are organized enough to demand things from them. I think I will stop there if that's all right, because I know we're going over time. Thank you so much, Race. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for, for driving this, like picturing this uh, pretty dark uh, picture in a way, but also giving us the, the, the tools uh, and, and probably the, uh, yeah, the, the lines to, to try to, to, to actually reshift those, uh, those, th this power, uh, this, the, the, those struggles. And, um, and I think that's, I mean, we are, we're running out of time and, and, and I won't be able to, to ask uh, how our, all of our panelists, all the questions that uh, I, I wanted to ask, but uh, looking at the, the, the Q&A and the question that have come up, I think one thing that was uh, stressed and that I, I think we, we, we can still have a, a bit of comments from, from the three of you is the fact that um, the Green New Deal is, is as well then said, it is, is part of, of other discourses, of other forces, of other movements. And what we what we really need now is to also learn from the different uh, experiences in the U.S. with with Bernie Sanders, as as Tia mentioned it in the U.K. with the the platform for, of of, of Jeremy Corbyn of how can we um, build build new new links between those the, the different struggles and and also in the post COVID or in the COVID crisis what do you see as new potential new alliances? Uh, the one that we should avoid as well, because uh, as, as Walden mentioned, uh, we see uh, possible ally uh, in, the, in some discourses, but then realize that uh, eco-fascism is not far or, or, or nationalism is, is, is always a threat. So I would like to have your, your your view on the on the new possible alliances and and struggles that need to be made. Also, uh, we Walden mentioned the the the, the Buen Vivir and all those global south movements. How we can can we like link up uh, the different uh, the different class struggles together to to actually implement those those programs? Because what what we've seen is that the the instruments are there, the ideas are there. We have we have and the money is there, but we need we need power, and maybe that's that's a question I want to ask first to to Walden. And, and, and uh, if our, just, yeah, yes, just as a reminder, uh, if you keep, could keep it very short in in a summary in two minutes. Sorry to ask you that, but we're running out of time. Thank you. Oh yes, I you know first of all I think that uh, there's a huge potential for alliances uh, uh, both within the north as well as you know within the south and 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 and, and um, you know uh, you know uh, uh, north and south I mean this is these are alliances that have been building up for some time we were together in the anti globalization movement uh, the 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 occupy movement the you know the the resistance to the financial crisis the climate justice movement uh, so uh, you know we have you know this these alliances that have been forged and now we just need 
we need at this point to move those alliances to a newer level, a, a stronger um, a level of greater solidarity, and a new and and a more organized level. So, so we're not starting from scratch, uh, you know. Uh, here, I mean, and you know, uh, these movements have interacted uh, internationally, uh, uh, you know, over the last. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 20 years. And we've had at that level victories uh, as well as defeats. You know, uh, one victory is, I think, uh, we, we, we stopped the World Trade Organization from being the planned, uh, you know, sort of neoliberal organization in the world that would, that would, that would uh, you know, uh, manage trade and in fact even go into investment. Uh, the the World Trade Organization today is 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 a shadow of what it was, and that was because of the resistance of developing countries as well as um, um, progressive movements. Uh, Seattle, for instance, was a great synergistic event between progressive movements, fifty thousand people on the streets, and the and and uh, you know developing countries that that refused to make any more concessions. So. Uh, I think we must learn, uh, look at those victories as well as look at those defeats and bring the lessons that we have there to this new situation that we have at this point. The, 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 the one thing that I would just like to say here and emphasize is that, yes, true, uh, Grace had said, you know, that um, they're moving into ever greater centralization, uh, you know, uh, and they still have a lot of, definitely a lot of power. But there's one thing I think that's emerging out of this is that the system, the legitimacy of the global system and of capitalism really has been hit very, very badly uh, at this point. And I think um, uh, once the legitimacy goes and the discrediting goes. Uh, I think that, you know, this is a very important step forward uh, for movements to really push in uh, and uh, to be able uh, to take advantage of this delegitimation that crisis has brought about to be able to push our alternatives. My sense is that coming out of this crisis, people will be more willing to listen to us. Uh, so that's there. And how do we translate that new uh, uh, listening to us into a material force that will basically um, intervene uh, in, you know, in, in politics in order to move things towards a progressive direction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Walden. Um, I will quickly ask to turn to, to Tia if she could uh, wrap up around this question as well. Sure. I promise to be both uh, short with my comments and speak slower at the same time somehow. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I second everything that, that Walden said and also Grace's like excellent sort of political economy uh, uh, sort of presentation. Um, and so there's a lot to chew on already. What I'll just add is that Despite the fact that people are extremely focused on their immediate survival in the U.S., you know, we have people with unable to you know, pay their rent, pay for their immediate needs and, and also affected by by the, the global health crisis. So despite the fact that, that people and households are 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 at, in a survival mode right now, um, and also despite the fact that social distancing makes normal forms of left politics difficult um, because we what the power that the left has is its numbers right and and the way that we display that power is through occupying public space through going on strike through actually using oftentimes our our bodies in public space to sort of send a message to power and that tool is not available to us anymore so we have to think of other ways to organize. But anyway, despite those two big limitations, people very focused on survival and the, the difficulties in organizing protests, we've actually seen a lot of organizing that's been happening over the past few weeks in the U.S. in those very constrained circumstances. And I think that speaks to the political opening that, that both Grace and Walden spoke about um, in different ways and that I spoke about as well. That speaks to the fact that we are in a political opening. It also speaks to the 
pre-existing um, um, past work of social movements to sort of populate the, the political sphere with much more radical ideas over the past few years. So I think that, you know, it's a testament to, to our cumulative building of power. Of course, our power is not enough. And Grace gave a very realistic depiction of the state of the balance of class power right now. Um, but, but it's not nothing. And I think in the U.S., at least, I will say that the left is in a more powerful position than it's been in my entire 20 years doing left activism, right? Um, so at, without a doubt, we contested national power. We have people in Congress. We have mayors. We have people in city council. Um, we had, you know, the, the, the best year in terms of work stoppages and a strike wave this past year for since since like the New Deal era. I mean, it's nowhere near as high as the 1930s, but it's the best year for like a long time. Right. And so we we are, you know, in to some extent in a better place, but not exactly where we need to be. But I'll just leave it with a couple of things. We have had some very effective strikes recently. They haven't been big in terms of numbers. I'm talking about Amazon workers, Instacart workers, different grocery store you know, chains and warehouse workers. They have not been huge in terms of numbers, but they've been very effective. Those strikes have won concessions from the state and from capital around protective gear, around paid sick leave, around hazard pay, you know, increased wages. And we need to just keep, you know, supporting those strikes if we're not an actual worker in one of those workplaces to support them. And for those workers, you know, to keep the pressure on, because it turns out that in this moment, even with fewer people going on strike, there's more effectiveness. Um, we also see that. The, the climate justice movement in the U.S., and I'm thinking of Sunrise and other movements, are keeping the pressure on Congress and on the Biden campaign to do much better and to have much better Green New Deal policies um, uh, than, than is currently on offer. So I think that in a variety of ways, movements are still organizing um, and we just need to think extremely creatively um, at the same time in terms of the limitations on protests and strikes. Um, and also, as Walden said, like continue to build and invigorate our networks, both within domestic contexts and across them. And if we had more time, I would talk a bit more about networks I'm involved in that, that are transnational and that, and that involve Latin comrades in Latin America. But I know that, that I'm up on my time right now. So anyone that wants to contact me is, is welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fia. Um, and I will just now turn to turn to Grace for the for the last words. You you already like started to to answer this question and, and pretty much. So if you just wanna maybe give also like the like with the situation in the in the UK with the probably the most hit hit uh, country in in Europe right now, um, and with just the start of a of a conservative uh, uh, government, what? What, 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 what is, what could we foresee right now? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, I agree um, with, uh, with both there and Walden actually on, on that analysis of the, the strength of the left and the fact that this presents an opportunity and an opening. Um, we are undoubtedly more effectively organised than we have been in, at any point during the neoliberal era, so really since the 1970s, which is great. I think the question now is how do we use our movement power to build class consciousness in, in wider society and, and throughout the world, um, because that's really been a big challenge. Um, there was an analysis of, of Corbynism that it was premised upon occupying the gap between the relative strength of the left in electoral politics. So the fact that there was, you know, a, a left wing leadership of the Labour Party and the relative weakness of progressive forces throughout wider society. Historically, that's been the other way around. We've had a strong labor movement. We've had strong social movements. We've had base seat. We've had kind of foundations of working class communities um, that had their own cultures and their own institutions. All those have been eroded by the pervasive individualization um, of our societies that have been associated with, with neoliberalism. So, you know, I think that the big task that left in the UK has now, and I'm sure it's similar in other parts of the world, is yes, continuing to focus on electoral politics, yes, continuing to focus on party politics, but also focusing on building back out into wider society, those progressive forces that can touch people's lives, not simply in the realm of, you know, just when they go to the voting booth, but in their jobs, in their communities and, and everywhere else they, they live and work. 
So for me, that means, yes, a strategy for, engage, for continuing to put pressure on politicians and continuing to engage in electoral politics or democratising the Labour Party for um, pushing for policies that are going to promote the interests of working people. But it also means community organising. There's really a lot that's going on now that we can build on in terms of the response to the coronavirus crisis through the emergence of these mutual aid networks. Uh, those are you know, providing support for people and people are going to be radicalised through their involvement in these networks. I think it's really important that we kind of engage with that afterwards. There's also, and I mean, this is probably the most important thing. I think this is the most important thing for organising internationally is the labour movement. You know, if we're going to be seeing the uh, emergence of these huge international monopolies, we need to start thinking about how we are organising workers vertically throughout supply chains within a big corporation. How do you get workers putting together, putting chips and phones in China, organising with um, at warehouse workers for Amazon in, you know, uh, the Rust Belt of the US with um tech workers in Silicon Valley with the people pulling those minerals out of the ground in Central Africa. How do you get uh, a network organizing um, that is centered around the experience of working for a particular organization and the experience of exploitation uh, under that system? Um, how do you get that off the ground? Now, that is one of the big, biggest challenges that the left has faced and a lot of people have said it's effectively impossible but I think we need to really think about how we do that and I think monopolization will potentially create an impetus towards that because so many workers will be concentrated in so few uh, few companies um, so yeah I'll stop there Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Grace. And I think those will, those will be the, the ending world and, and I hope that we will have the opportunity to actually tackle this question of the of the international labor movements and i think that will be part of the of our upcoming series and i think that's what we we wanted to do today is to give this also this general overview of the of what a, a green new deal or a radical green new deal could look like in this time of 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 covid crisis and um, to also already enter into the into some like critical question around the uh, around power uh, class struggle and and also like we've been mentioning and uh, and Tia and, and Walden has been men have mentioned the, the question of trade and all those questions will be like followed up in the in the in the coming uh, the coming weeks um next week we have our uh, second uh, second episode so this time it's at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Central European uh, time and uh, 1 p.m. for the New York audience. And we will, we will have the chance to, to have uh, Mike Davis, Maud Barlow and uh, Martin Schiedelman from the European Parliament. So thank you again. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you for, uh, for uh, also bearing with the little... Uh, sometimes complication with the, the technicalities but this is and um, this is the, the 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 new normal in those uh, those covid times and and as i said before at the beginning i really i really hope that this uh, those those webinars and and uh, will give us at the same time a sense of community and organizing uh, both things that that we need according to our fantastic panelists so again thank you very much for joining well then Grace and Tia, and uh, hopefully see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Alain. Thanks so much. This was great. Thanks, Tia, Grace, Nassim. Thank you, Walden. Thank you. Yes, everybody.